Stay hungry, stay foolish. We are on the leading edge of a smart machine age led by artificial intelligence that will be as transformative for us as the industrial revolution was for our ancestors. Smart machines will take over millions of jobs in manufacturing, office work, the service sector, the professions, you name it. Not only can they know more data and analyze it faster than any mere human, but smart machines are free of the emotional, psychological and cultural baggage that so often mars human thinking. So we can't beat them and we can't join them. To stay relevant, we have to play a different game. Our guest today offers that game plan. We need to excel at critical, creative and innovative thinking and at genuinely engaging with others, things machines can't do well. The key is to change our definition of what it means to be smart. Our guest today calls it new smart. The crucial mindset underlying New Smart is humility, not self effacement, but an accurate self appraisal, acknowledging you can't have all the answers, remaining open to new ideas, and committing yourself to lifelong learning. The key to success in this new era is not to be more like machines, but to excel at the best of what makes us human. We welcome the author of Humility is the New Smart. Rethinking Human Excellence in the Smart Machine Age. Edward Hess, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's one, wonderful to be with you and wonderful to be with your listeners. And please, please call me Ed. Ed, great to have you on the show. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about why to call you Ed with a lowercase e as well later on in the show. But I, <laughs> before we start today's show, I want to thank our partners, Microsoft for Startups, and Ed, I thought we'd start today's show by introducing some terminology that you use in the book, in particular, two core concepts. The first is SMA, the smart machine age, and the second is core to that game plan I mentioned in the introduction today, which is the term new smart. Well, the smart machine age is, is really the convergence of several accelerating technologies led by artificial intelligence, including deep learning but it involves higher processing computers, connectivity, virtual and augmented reality, biogenetics, et cetera, et cetera, that all of these technologies, and especially artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is going to basically take over most cognitive processing, most linear processing that goes on in the world. And whether it's the business world or a, a not-for-profit organization or even just human, human learning. And what's left for us humans to do? Well, us humans basically have to excel, just as you stated in the opening, what the technology cannot do well. And that's higher order, critical, innovative, imaginative, creative thinking. And as or more importantly, emotional and social intelligence. The ability to connect and relate on an emotionally positive basis with other human beings. Really, going forward, if you look out 10 years from now, the two human skills that are going to be basically what makes us unique is emotional intelligence and our ability to adapt. And our ability to adapt is the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn at the pace of change. I call that hyperlearning. All of that, the ability to emotional intelligence and the, the ability to connect and relate with other human beings in a positive manner so that you basically can collaborate effectively, so that you can build caring, trusting teams, so that you can have meaningful relationships. All of this, the foundational building block is humility. Humility is the building block to being able to do the types of work that the technology is not going to be able to do. It's foundational to meaningful relationships. Really, when you get down to it, it's foundational to a meaningful life. So the smart machine age is just the overarching theme that technology is going to be, in many cases, much smarter than us. So we need a new smart. And for the skeptics that may believe that machines can't tackle the non-routine cognitive tasks, 
you have deeply researched this topic and devoured over 600 leading academic papers, over 100 leading books, and conducted extensive field research. And you conclude, Ed, that for any given skill we can think of, some computer scientist somewhere is already working on an algorithm to do that task. You're exactly right, especially with respect to cognition, especially with respect to, we'll call it thinking. It's interesting. Um, last July, Daniel Kahneman was a Nobel laureate and wrote probably the best book on cognitive thinking was being interviewed, and for the first time he said the following, and I'm paraphrasing, I have come to the conclusion there is no human mental thinking process that technology will not be able to do better than we. I mean, that's like a wow, all right? So that leaves, if you will, the types of thinking where the technology can't do, and there there is. Okay, what does technology need? Technology needs lots of data so that if you basically are, you know, trying to create new things or you're exploring the unknown or you have areas where there's not lots of data, that will be the type of human thinking thinking that's still left to humans. All right. Moral judgments are going to be made by humans. Any type of, if you will, I'll call really creative, innovative, imaginative, where you've got to go into the unknown and explore and basically discover by doing rapid experiments and trying things and seeing what works and what doesn't work. In many cases, technology is not going to be able to do that because technology doesn't have an imagination. The things that technology is not going to have is an imagination, a heart, and a soul. And we basically have to figure out how do we accentuate, develop, share our imagination, our heart, and our soul with other human beings because that's what's going to make us unique. And underlying all of that is how do we come to the game? What do we bring to the table? What do we bring to the conversation? And you have to come to the table with humility, because humility is what makes you open to the new, the different, which makes you able to effectively listen, which makes you able to connect emotionally with other people, because the psychological definition of humility, which you made a couple of points about, what it basically says is to really be our best self, we have to be selfless and not wrapped up in our ego, in proving we're right, proving we know, et cetera. And the challenge with this, Aiden, is, is, is that we humans are wired to seek confirmation of what we believe, to affirm our ego, and to seek cohesiveness of our stories of how the world works. We are cognitively blind. We have confirmation biases. We are, if you will, fearful of making mistakes and looking stupid and not being liked, you know, and all of that. And so we, we have this definition of ourselves that's defined by how much I know or what I know. You know, when was the first time someone said you were smart? I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing you now. Yes. When was the first time someone said you're smart? You could think back. Yeah. Your parent, your elementary school teacher. Yeah, and this is key, actually. And, and we'll jump to this. I had this question line of question for you because this is key that we get tied to this idea of being smart and we create a mental model around it. And, and you share this yourself. But for me, Ed, to answer your question was probably when I was a kid and it was probably something my parents said. And then what happens is you start protecting that way of being smart and you start to build a mental model around it, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love if you if you delved into that a little bit now. Yes, you're you're exactly right. Your parents then when you got to school, okay, when you got to elementary school, we call it here, but I mean, you know, when you when you when you got to school at a at a young age, at some point in time you got the right answer or you made a good score on a test or you did something nice, whatever. And the teacher says, You're smart. And from early on, we sort of learned that 
being smart means not making mistakes. Being smart means I know something and I know something better than somebody else. All right. And, and so we, we start identifying ourselves with, I'm smart. I know more than you. Okay. And it's and then as you, we go along, the more we know, the smarter we are. Every time we got an A in school, okay, I'm smart. All right. And so you start identifying your ego with what you know and how much you know. And so you get down into, you know, you reach adulthood, all right, and you've been successful like you have, and you have all these stories about how the world works. And, you know, I come into your life and we're having a conversation and I say, I disagree with you. I might, you know, my story is different. And, you know, your normal human reaction is going to be, whoa, okay. I know my story's right because, <laughs> you know, I know. And, and instead of saying, you know, and I'm, we're just role playing here because you wouldn't probably act this way. Instead of the, 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 the normal reaction of most people, instead of asking, okay, Ed, what do, what do you think? Why do you think that? You're saying, wait a minute. I'm right because of this. And we immediately start to defend and deflect and deny. And what, what goes on is, is that we basically, our ego is wrapped up into being, I'll call it the old smart by what I know and how much I know. And what the new smart concept is, is we need to define ourselves by the quality of our thinking, listening, relating, and collaborating. It is a quality definition, and thinking, listening, relating, and collaborating are the underlying behaviors that are going to be needed in order for us human beings to have meaningful work and a meaningful life in a world that's going to be dominated by technology. Ed, I'd love to dwell on this because there's a great saying that if you were to walk into your kitchen someday and you noticed the kitchen sink was overflowing. What do you do? Do you grab a mop or do you turn off the tap, right? And I mentioned that to say, there's two things we can do here. One is turn off the tap, which is to stop it happening. And that we can do that with our children and future generations, which is what you do in your work in education, etc. And also we can start mopping, which is to focus on ourselves. Because so many of our, our listeners are parents and in true humble style, you share how you lacked sporting prowess as a yes. child and became wedded to the idea of intelligence and protecting that intelligence. And I'd love to share this because this is what happens. And actually, we're the ones, us parents, are the ones who start the ball rolling with that mentality with our children. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to I was raised in a small town uh, in a rural setting in Georgia. I was, um, I would say, uh, I was not an athlete, and in the community that I lived in, the sport of U.S. football was everything. In fact, in our little town, it, it was known for being a great football school in town, and the heroes in town were the football heroes and the cheerleaders, and and um, it was a little town of about eight to 10,000 people back then, and so I went out for peewee football, and I was the only kid in the second grade in my town who was not chosen to be on the football team because I was just not a good athlete. And it was devastating. I mean, all my friends went to football practice. My parents never said they were unhappy with me. But I mean, you know, they couldn't talk about, you know, there was no need for them to go to the games. I became, in a way, a little bit of an outcast. And I didn't do it consciously. but. I did have a skill. I had a very good memory and I could learn very fast. And so I said to myself, well, I'm going to be a winner too. I'm going to be the smartest kid in the room. I'm going to know the answers first when the teacher asks questions. And back then, you know, we in school, you had, you know, spelling bees every week, these type of bees. I mean, you know, all types of competitions where kids would, you know, line up in the and when you got the wrong answer, you had to sit down. Well, I started out, I said, I'm going to basically be the smartest person. And 
whenever a teacher had a question, I was the kid that basically stood in the front row and raised his hand and shook his hand until the teacher called on. And, and I was very fortunate. I nailed the answer almost all the time. When we had the spelling bee, I'd get the big Webster's dictionary at home and I'd study it hours while my friends are at football practice. I'm studying the dictionary. I win the spelling bees. The teacher decides she needs to change from the spelling bee because I was winning every week. She does the Bible bee. Okay, so I start studying the Old Testament and the New Testament. I start winning the Bible bees every week and it goes on. So my being was defined in my, and all of a sudden I became a popular kid. All of a sudden the football stars liked me. All of a sudden the cheerleaders would look at me. Okay. And that was my entry into society by being smart. And I basically used that approach for 33 years (laughs) and I became very successful and Prior to going to academia, I was in the the business world for 20 years as an executive. I was very successful. And in about age 33, I sort of hit a wall and I was never arrogant. I just had to win and I didn't attack people. I just had to be the one with the right answer. And it, it hit me at that age 33 that, wait a minute, I've got these teams And the job is not for me to basically show the teams how smart I am. It's to develop them. I basically had to adopt a new way of collaborating, a new way of listening. I mean, I was an awful listener. I think for 33 years, I never asked the person who made a statement a question about what they were saying to make sure I understood them. I was sort of locked and loaded. When you stopped talking, I basically launched. And here I came with my views. Or here I came with my views as to either why I'm right or why you're wrong. And so I was a piece of work. The reason I succeeded is I was never evil, mean, or really arrogant. I mean, I got along with people. They liked me. I never hurt people. And when I was a leader, I always basically took care of my people and got them big pay raises, transfers, sent them to school, helped them along the way. But I was not, in using the psychological definition, humility. I didn't possess humility. And because of that, I really wasn't that good of a learner. And also because of that, I didn't have deep emotional connections at home or deep emotional connections with my people. And I had to work on that. So I had to basically go through a major transformation, which to some extent I'm still on and um, maybe will always be on because I basically bought into this rule, this game in society that You get A's by knowing more than other people, and you get A's by not making mistakes. So therefore, that's how you succeed. I also asked you that, Ad, because I was the flip side. I was the equivalent to you. I was was not picked all the time, but I wasn't as smart. But I eventually got picked, and I became a professional sports player. And I played for over a decade. But what I found in that world was equally the same things happen, because people become their jersey, (laughs) and they become defined by the sports they played and, you know, this idea of I used to be somebody who used to be a contender (laughs) sitting on the bar. Mm -hmm. It's exemplified in NFL and in your national sport, let's call it American football. When an NFL player retires on an average salary of about $2 million, they're usually broke within a couple of years because they can't let go of the person they used to be. And I think it's such an important message in this new world, in the smart machine age. But bringing it this concept into the business world and into the workplace, there's a key element in the book here. It's easier for other people to help us if we view collaboration not as a competition to see who was right, but rather as a conversation to find out the most accurate answer. Yes. And the point is based on the science that says we can't achieve excellence in the type of thinking that humans are going to be needed to do. And we can't achieve excellence in the type of emotionally engaging humans are going to be needed to do by ourselves. We can't overcome our confirmation biases by ourselves. We can't all of a sudden become this open-minded person. And the other thing is we still are wired the same way. May I share just a short story? Please do, Ed. Please do. I was in... uh, London, England, and the date's forever in my mind, November 11th, 2017. 
doing a talk with 50 global chief technology officers of the big European companies. And my wife and I try to travel together when I go overseas, because as I've stated in the show, I was raised in a rural environment. And one of her missions is to basically take me to theater and opera to get some culture when we go. So she went with me and we always have a great time and we, we love London. And we're at the British Museum and we're having, we get ready to have lunch. We go to the dining room and I sit with my wife at a table for two. So it's very close together. And my wife asked a question. She said, you know, what are you going to order? And we talk and she says, well, I'm going to have the grilled salmon and a salad. Would you like French fries? And she knows that I don't like French fries that much, but I know that if I say no, she won't order. So I say, yeah, I'll have a French fry or two. So we order French fries and the rest of the dinner. We're sitting there and our waiter comes up and puts a little saucer. The saucer is not, a, is not white. It has a color and puts a saucer between us. And we're sitting real close together. I mean, the, the saucer's within a, 10 inches of her and 10 inches of me. And I look down at that saucer. And I look, and it's half full of ketchup. And I don't know why, but that upset me. <laughs> and, and I'm saying to myself, as much as we're paying for this lunch, my wife deserves a full saucer of ketchup. <laughs> and it starts basically, you know, I'll use a t colloquial term, frost in my cake. But I know that if I call the waiter over here and tell him to bring my wife a saucer, my wife because she's an independent person, will be upset because if she wanted more ketchup, she'd ask for it, and I shouldn't be trying to solve her problems. So I'm just going a slow burn. And generally speaking, us males, when we our emotions get the better of us, our earlobes tend to get warm and red. Well, my earlobes felt like they were on fire. So lunch comes pretty quickly. Plates are put down, and my wife picks up a French fry, and she goes to dip it, and she said, Okay. Would you like ketchup or mayonnaise? I said, what? She said, would you like ketchup or mayonnaise? And I look at the saucer. The saucer was not a white saucer. The saucer was half full of ketchup and half full of mayonnaise. I was cognitively blind. I did not see that mayonnaise. That's why I was upset. Now, why was I cognitively blind? Because as I mentioned before, I grew up in rural Georgia. In rural Georgia, you ate ketchup on French fries and you ate mayonnaise on tomato sandwiches and you didn't mix it. <laughs> and so that's cognitive blindness. The confirmation bias, which we all have, means that we do not process information that basically we don't already either know or believe because our brain is a prediction machine. Our brain predicts what we're going to feel, what we're going to perceive, what we're going to, in effect, think, even before we're cognizant of what's going on in our body. We're prediction machines. And thankfully, a lot of the times the brain is right. But basically, not processing information or not hearing it or not giving it to do weight, that's why I need you. I need you to stress test my thinking. I need you to ask questions. I need you to challenge me in a non-competitive way. And so long as I think you care about me as a person, and so long as I trust you that you're not trying to hurt me, and vice versa, the two of us will come up with a much better answer than you'll come up by yourself or I'll come up by yourself. And in the complex world we are going to live in, in the smart machine age, no human being by themselves will achieve excellence. It's going to require teams working together with other people. And in order to do that effectively, you have to be the type of person that other people want to work with. And I submit to you that if you have basically embrace the psychological concept of humility, you're more likely to be the person that someone wants to work with and wants to help than if you're an arrogant know-it-all. And it's important to add, Ed, as you do in the book, you say most of us have had no formal training in how to think, how to listen, how to learn and experiment through inquiry, how to emotionally engage, how to manage emotions, how to collaborate, or how to embrace mistakes as learning opportunities. 
This is because Western and particularly US culture favors high grades over mastery, aggressiveness over competitiveness, and the avoidance of failure at all costs, all of which hinder thinking, creativity, relating, and learning at our very best. You go on to say, though, organizations need to engage their people and foster a sense of being a hyper learner. Yes. And by hyper learner, I mean person who can learn unlearn and relearn at the pace of change. And that is, if you will, the skill of the future. And the foundational building block of that is humility, because humility underlies being a good listener, being open-minded, connecting and relating emotionally with other people, having empathy and compassion, it underlies having effective collaboration. You can't have caring, trusting teams if you basically have people that are full of themselves, out for themselves, and only care about themselves. That's sort of, if, if you will, and if you look at an organization going forward, I believe the successful organization is going to be built upon some psychological principles of positive emotions because positive emotions enable learning, negative emotions inhibit learning, Uh, psychological safety. My friend Amy Edmondson's great, great work on psychological safety uh, is core and so important because you have to feel safe with other people. And that's why personal competition can't be in your workplace. Okay. If you want to have competition, your competition is a competitor. And then the question comes down to long term, do I really need competition or should I be highly motivated to be the best self I can be? And if I'm trying to be the best self and my teammates are trying to be the best self and we're trying to do the best work, maybe our biggest competition is ourselves. Maybe if we liberate ourselves from our old way of working and our old way of being, maybe then we can be all sort of all that we can be. And I firmly believe my biggest competition is myself, and that is in managing myself, managing my thinking, managing my emotions, managing my ego, overcoming my fear and insecurities. Everybody's fearful and everybody's insecure. It's just a matter of degree, and it's a matter of how you manage it, you know, especially with fears. Do we let fears basically make choices for us, or do we basically own our fears, manage our fears? Do we let fears overwhelm us or do we basically harness them in where they basically where we we don't behave in ways that are detrimental to other people? I'm talking about just normal life. I'm not talking about if you were a a special forces operations military person protecting your country in a mission. And I'm not not talking about a police officer or or that's having to protect people or et cetera. I'm talking about just normal. We'll call it like normal business environment type stuff. And the concept here is, 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 is almost like, okay, how do I bring my best self to work? What's the mindset? What's the behaviors I need? And what's the processes I'm going to use in order to be the best learner I can be and the best collaborator I can be? And the part of the mindset is the new smart principles, okay, that we, we, we mentioned one of them, for example, before. The behaviors, the humility book, people always ask me, how did you pick out these behaviors? Well, this is this is what I did. And I'm not saying it's foolproof. I'm not saying it's the only way to do this. But I started thinking deeply in January of 2014 about what are the skills that humans are going to have that the technology is not going to do well. And we've mentioned those. Critical thinking, innovative thinking, imagination, emotional engagement with other people. And then I s- spent a lot of time, well, in order to be good at those skills, how does someone need to behave? All my work, the humility book and the book which is coming out in August, all of it is behavioral based. Good intentions are not enough. Business concepts have to be operationalized through behaviors. And so I'm into a behavioral approach to learning, a behavioral approach to being smart. So I started thinking, what are the behaviors? Hmm. Well, I need to be and the behaviors basically are, you know, are, are what's in the book. Humility, reflective listening, otherness, being able to connect and relate in a positive way with other people, open-mindedness, collaboration, effective collaboration. And so 
How do you behave to get those results? And that's what led me, if you will, down this journey of the granularity of defining these behaviors. And that's what underlies the diagnostic in the book, what I call the, the new smart behaviors, where the key behaviors, there's a diagnostic for people to take. And, you know, I've had used that diagnostic on over 3,000 senior executives. You know, and I can just tell all our friends that are listening, just say if it, there are questions where the right answer is a, a one, not a five, not the biggest number, just to keep people honest. But generally speaking, if you answer that, every 3,000 people, if they when they answer it honestly, there are very few high scores because we've never been trained how to listen. We've never been trained how to think. And especially, we've never been trained how do we manage our emotions? How do we basically harness in negative emotions? How do we generate positive emotions? How do we actually connect with people emotionally? What's what's going on biochemically in our body? And the book gets into this type of granularity so that you basically can take small steps to have a personal development program. What I call the, you know, it's, it's, it's in effect your, your journey to your best self. That's what this is all about. And if, if we all are on similar journeys, I can tell you in companies that I've worked with and teams I've worked with, it's magical what can happen. It's magical what can happen. And it's just not me using that those words. It's, 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 it's actually seeing it happen, feeling it, but having the people who are actually doing it. Almost all of my consulting is experiential workshops. You, you can't learn this stuff. You can understand it by reading, but you can't learn it until you actually go out and try and do it. And you measure yourself after every meeting. I need to work on listening. Okay. And you have a checklist after every meeting. Give yourself a grade on each of the points. Did I ask questions before I told people my answer? Did I make sure I understood the other person? Did I take a pause? Was I truly present in listening all the time or was I making up my answer while the person was talking? I used to be A++ on making up my answer before the other person was finished. <laughs> then, then, when, then when I was sure, pretty sure, couldn't be sure, pretty sure that I knew that there was nothing new, I interrupted. And so I went, you know, I went through over 10 years of, uh, in, in the business world of being a, I was never arrogant or anything. I'd, I'd say, well, let me interrupt, you know. So I'd say it in a soft voice. And then I'd tell them my answer. You know, I mean, I wouldn't lean forward in somebody's face, but I did the same thing. Basically, you know, when I had it all figured out, I said, game over. Call the question. Here's the answer. Let's move on. If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> but you, you weren't, like, that, you weren't that, is, that far up the oh, spectrum. Gee, with that. uh, that's oh, so apropos. I mean, if you could see me, I'm probably blushing and turning red. I mean, that probably I, I should have been wearing. T I should be wearing embroidered shirts or T-shirts with that on back in my old life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all do that sometimes, man. And uh, a great uh, guest on the show before was a guy called Julian Treasure, and he has one of the most listened to TED Talks of all time called How to Be Heard, and he has a book of the same title. And he said when other people are talking, what we usually engage is in a thing called script writing, where we're writing our answer right. <laughs> before they're even finished talking. But uh, I thought it'd be really useful for the listener, because you mentioned the behaviors there, and we'll mention those four core behaviors, but there was five key principles that exemplify the new SMART. One we touched on, which is I'm defined not by what I know yeah. or how much I know, but the quality of my thinking, listening, relating, and collaborating. And it's exemplified by the quote, I will not identify with the content of any belief. I will only identify with the way I come to my beliefs. That's the first one. But the second one, let's move on to this because we won't have time to share them all. There's four left. The second I absolutely love, it, which is my mental models are not reality. They are only my generalized stories of how my world works. And here you reference Ed Catmull, the founder of Pixar. Yeah, and that's uh, that's one of the, the principles at, uh, at Pixar, which is a very, as you know, very creative animated studios uh, company. And, and, and the science is clear. I mean, our mental models are not reality. They're, they're just our stories because the science now is basically getting very sophisticated in that if, if we're out Let's just say we're standing, you know, you're standing out in Dublin in a, in a, you know, in a street and there's lots going on. 
okay, you're going to perceive maybe 1% of what's going on. And what you're going to perceive, all right, in your consciousness is stuff that basically it confirms what you believe. And so for us to think our stories, since we there's so much we don't see, okay? Uh, scientists, neuroscientists said recently, we see what we believe. And that's the essence. So if I see what I believe, and once I realize there's so much knowledge out there and different ways of looking at things, my mental models are not reality. They're just my story. So what's your story? Okay, Jane, what's your story? Bill, what's your story? Mary, what's your story? Well, if they come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different training, different schooling, different expertise, they're going to bring to the table very additive stuff. And it's through that amalgamation of all that additive that we can basically get a better definition of reality or create a new definition, whether it's innovation, imagination. The, the third point, I am not my ideas and I must decouple my beliefs. And I'm not talking about virtues, values, decouple my beliefs from my ego. Don't define myself by my idea. When I was started on my journey before every meeting that I would go into, I would, outside the meeting room, take 15, 30 seconds and go, I am not my ideas. This is not about me. I am not my ideas. This is not about me. It's not my ideas. I'm not my ideas. This is not about me. I'd say that probably five, six times each to remind myself, I'm not my ideas, and this is not about me. This is not basically about my ego. Okay? How can I make a contribution? The fourth one, I must be open-minded and treat my beliefs, not my values. So just say treat my ideas as hypothesis to be constantly tested and subject to modification by better data. But this is basically saying every one of us needs to think like a good scientist. Everything I believe is my hypothesis. And I started training years ago in my teaching and in my consulting when I'm having conversations with people. I no longer say I believe this. I say this is my hypothesis. And I found that the more I could say this is how my hypothesis, it was easier to have it be modified if someone's got better data. It's just a hypothesis. It's and then the fifth one is very important, especially in a culture, in the, the culture of survival of the fittest in the United States. Our our business culture is very different than most business cultures around the world. Is mistakes and failures are opportunity to learn. And I'll put quotation mark, so long as you're not making the same mistake over and over. Because if you're making the same mistake over and over, then you're not learning. So mistakes and failures are opportunities to learn so long as they're within financial risk parameters and so long as you're not making the same mistake over and over. And so if you basically come to the table, what those principles do, it makes it easier to divorce your self-image, and how you define yourself from what's going on in the meeting. It's easy for you to have a story about yourself that's quality-based. I'm a good collaborator. I do a good job of listening to people. I help people come to better answers. People want me on their team because I'm a good team player. And that doesn't mean go along, get along. That means you bring value, different viewpoints, but you come to the meetings in a way that liberates other people. And you become a role model and it becomes easier for other people to act the same way. And then all of a sudden, you start having really, really great conversations. And all of a sudden, you end up. You know, everybody's been in a state of flow and when you're all in and the time is going by and you're just all involved and it's just all like magical. The goal I have in my work is to help small teams have collective flow where all four, five, six people are all in to the project. And it's just like magical what comes out.
and you cite so many of these companies that have these principles already in place and one of them is the great bridgewater associates ray dalio's company and you interviewed ray and you interviewed the company and i found this so exhilarating to think when you were talking to employees of bridgewater you said one of them made a statement something like instead of feeling insecure when my thinking or my hypothesis is challenged i now feel insecure if my thinking is not challenged, I yeah. absolutely love that. Imagine that being the culture where yes. you were just kind of going, what, what do you think, guys? And you, and you open it up to be attacked. And, and that's actually a good thing because the thing I find so liberating about your work is this world is in unbelievable flux, only going to be accelerated by COVID-19. And Nobody knows the answers. So therefore, we all need to be working together. And as Amy Edmondson, she was on the show, by the way, Ed, before Christmas, a, a fantastic episode. And she had a lovely saying where she said, everybody in the organization needs to be censors to feel what's going on and be able to report it back to a central repository in order to navigate the ship going forward. She is such a wonderful human being and a wonderful thinker and she liberates people with her uh, if you will her her research and her approach and and the, the wonderful thing is that she walks the talk what's wonderful is when you see leading academics who actually walk the talk they behave the way that they're trying to espouse to people one of the things Ed, you got me thinking about there was you were saying about the embracing failure and again going back to instilling that mindset in our kids you know one of the things I, I probably my kids think i'm a nut job i'm always kind of dropping i'm like confucius dropping a little bit nuggets of knowledge wherever i can <laughs> i probably wreck their heads but one of the things is if i go to my kids how how do you learn they go by making mistakes and that japanese proverb fall down seven times get up eight is baked into their skull because this is where this all goes awry somewhere along the way but i remember an incident with my young kid he's six and he, he came home and he was about three at the time ed mm. and he was fearful about coloring in can you imagine that as a kid he was fearful that he would go outside the mm. lines and it came to my mind when i was reading your book because you talk about perfectionism and perfectionism is an absolute killer and you quote brenny brown in the book where you say where she says research shows that perfectionism hampers achievement Perfectionism is correlated with depression, anxiety, addiction, and life paralysis and missed opportunities. The fear of failing, making mistakes, not meeting people's expectations and being criticized keeps us outside the arena where healthy competition and striving unfolds. Absolutely legendary quote. But this idea of perfectionism and is so toxic in the work environment. Yeah, and, and if I just share a short story. One of my previous books, I did a case study on Intuit when Intuit was going, wanted to transform its, its whole company to an innovation company. And one of the things they did after they got into it, they basically announced to the company, no longer will you be allowed to use the word mistake inside Intuit. Because whenever you're doing experiments or you're trying things and you get an answer different than you expected. We call that a surprise, not a mistake. So from here on out in a learning situation, mistakes will be called surprises. And I, I think that, that just using that word with children, you know, I was learning to ride the bicycle and I put my foot here and I fell off. No, you didn't make a mistake. What you were thought would work, didn't work, so you're surprised. Okay, I made a surprise. What do I do with the surprise? Well, I better put my foot a different way. Okay, go try again. Brilliant way of thinking. And just to reinforce the strength of this book and the strength of the research you've put in, we had former CEO of Assurant Craig LeMasters on the show last week, and he spoke of the requirement for humility as a leadership skill, the necessity of it as a leadership skill. And that was echoed by another recent guest, Bill Treasurer, who calls a lack of humility out as a leadership killer. But in your research and interviews with leaders such as Jim Quinn, the then president of Tiffany & Co, Bridgewater's Ray Dalio, as we mentioned, Scott Cook, co-founder of Intuit, Lazo Bach of Google, 
all these hugely successful leaders highlight humility as key in this increasingly complex business environment. Yes. John Hennessy, who is the chairman of Alphabet, Google parent company, and was the former president of Stanford University and head of the School of Engineering in Stanford and one of the founders of Silicon Valley. His new leadership book has about 10 chapters, and he starts out chapter one. The number one important thing for a leader is humility. It's something that, you know, you hear about and it's it's not spoken about in a knowledgeable way, which which you do brilliantly here. And you give us right back to the histo- history of it, back to Socrates, etc. Moving on, because I mentioned th- there were the five principles we talked about, Ed. And next, you talk about the four key behaviors required in the smart machine age, quieting ego, managing self, reflective listening and otherness. In the book, you offer ideas, templates, processes, and tips gathered from science, field research, work with managers and leaders, and your own experiences and experiments in trying to improve new smart behaviors. We won't have time to explore them all, but perhaps you'd share a top line on these four key behaviors. The quiet ego, we've, we've been talking about the humility and the new smart principles and how to approach it. I think managing self is extremely important being able to understand that we need to mitigate our reactiveness. We need to take ownership of how we think. And the book puts forth and gives basically different different templates as to, you know, question critical thinking questions, uh, a, a methodology for how to go into the unknown and figure it out. So how do you basically take ownership of your thinking and have checklists that you can use to make sure, well, I didn't ask this, we didn't think about this, et cetera. The emotions are are mission critical because most people are not taught how to manage their emotions, how when they're basically uh, have a reactive, they basically just, you know, things just happen in your body and they just go to a natural, you know, a natural endpoint, you believe. Well, no, you can take ownership of it. And the book is really big on the concept of choice. We have a choice of how we behave. We have a choice as to how we react to our emotions. We have a choice as to whether we express our emotions. We have a choice. And so the book puts forth the science of how do you basically manage emotions, especially negative emotions, so they don't overwhelm you, or if you will, become like you know, you're riding a horse and the horse starts bucking and, 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 and wanting to run, that letting the horse own you instead of you owning the horse. And then the book also has practices as to how do you generate positive emotions, because positive emotions, emotions basically are chemically based in our body. And there are ways that you can basically tame down the negative to be in more in control of it. And there's ways to generate the positive stuff. The listening, we talked about it. The otherness part is emotionally connecting and relating to other people. And there's a science to connecting and relating to other people. There's a science. And what's so interesting is, is a, if you look at what determines the quality of your connection and your relating, the lowest valued thing is your words. Okay, it's more your tone and your body language, your eye contact or lack lack of eye contact. And the neuroscience shows to have, we'll call it a good emotionally connected relationship. And I'm talking not love and romance. I'm talking about trust, caring for each other. It basically has to be a synchronization between certain chemicals in my body and chemicals in your body. And that's all done by our bodies without us really knowing about it. And it depends on how you look at me. It depends on what I'm sensing from you, what you're sensing from me. And so the science of connecting, all right, the power of eye contact, the power of smiles, the power of asking questions, okay, the, the, the power of basically having stillness and, and relaxation in your body, which I can sense and you can sense mine. All of that is sort of laid out in the book. A lot of it is sort of how to do this, how to improve based on what the science says research shows. And 
but it's it's the attempt was to write it in a very accessible manner. I'm not the brightest light bulb in the pack. All right. You know, my greatest strength is is probably I just I'm disciplined and I work hard. And so I tried to get it to the point where, you know, if I don't understand it and I can't operationalize it through behaviors, it doesn't go in my book. Because otherwise, I'm just telling people what other people think. And I don't know whether it works or not. Most everything in that in that book, you know, I can validate from my own. Yeah, this stuff can work. You do a great job of it. I really do. I absolutely love the book. And it, it totally spoke to the spirit of this show. And I mentioned something at the start, and perhaps we'll finish with this, was the idea of Ed with a lowercase e, because I came across this and I, I was emailing you before to ask you on the show. And of course, I addressed you like, dear Edward, etc. But then I changed it to hi, lowercase Ed. And there's a story behind this. Yeah, there's a, there's a story. And, uh, you know, I I used to sign my name Ed, and the E was a was a big loopy E, okay? So a loop and coming down and then the D. And, you know, when I was doing s- this research and stuff, I was getting getting ready and, and, and um, you know, I was signing something and it just hit me. What's going on with this big E? Whoa, wait a minute. What am I trying to s- tell somebody with that big letter? What if I signed it a little e and a little d? How would it feel? So I said, maybe that big E has to do with ego. (laughs) And so I started signing years ago, everything, even my emails, with a little e. And it felt, it was almost like, almost a little bit like the breath came out of me. Or a calmness came out of me. And when I sign my emails now with a, a little e, it, it also, I think, impacts how I'm writing and coming across in the in the email. I mean, it's it's rare I write an email where I say, you know, dear Jane, I have this problem, we have this problem, here we need to talk about this, here's what I think. There's always some type of, I try to, well, wait a minute, I need to connect. This this is human to human, personal to personal. And so I, the little E, signing with the little E, was part of my ego reduction training program. It's a wonderful exercise that we can all share, coupled with things like breathing, meditation, mindfulness, etc. And this is a reminder that this show was brought to you with thanks to Microsoft for Startups. For people who want to find out more about your work, your books, etc. Where can they find you? Basically, go to the business school, Darden, www.myname.darden, D A R D E N, dot E D U, and look me up there, and they'll see my bio and my list of books, articles, interviews, etc. But the easiest way to find me and everything is on is on Google because it'll take you to my Darden website. It'll take you to various things that that have been published. Fantastic, Ed. It's been an absolute And, and I, I want to say that uh, I want to close by thanking you for the very meaningful conversation and, and, and thanking you for all the work that you put in, in, not only in reading the book, but in understanding the book and caring about the book. And that's that makes this conversation so much more meaningful for, I hope, for your listeners and everything, because you really got into you were into the granular operalization and how all this stuff works and the why in a, in a very a wonderful manner for your, your audience. They're very fortunate to have you, and I know you're fortunate to have them, and, and I'm very fortunate to be able to, to be with you. And so from the bottom of my heart, uh, you know, with a, with, a big, with a big hug, man, I thank you very much, and I do hope our paths cross again. It's been an absolute honor, Ed. And, you know, you said there about not being the smartest cookie. I certainly am not the smartest cookie. I'm disciplined. And it's an absolute honor to read the work of all the guests I have on every week. And your work was very special to me. And I really, really enjoyed it. And before I, I sign off, Ed, and thank you for your brilliant knowledge and wisdom today, I want to thank our partners, Microsoft for Startups. Thank you for your support and helping us grow the show. We now have a newsletter, so go ahead to the innovationshow.io. You can sign up for weekly update or monthly update on the show. 
And I'd like to thank our guest today, author of Humility is the New Smart, Rethinking Human Excellence in the Smart Machine Age, Ed Hess. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Best to everyone.